This is the Tallahassee Business Podcast, brought to you by the Tallahassee Chamber of Commerce. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Event Owl, who's helping clients across the nation elevate virtual, hybrid, and live events. Learn more at eventowl.com. Thanks for joining us and enjoy this episode of the Tallahassee Business Podcast. Well, hello, everyone. This is Sue Dick with the Greater Tallahassee Chamber of Commerce, bringing you our podcast and very excited for our speaker today. I know that our listeners are going to uh, in, really enjoy hearing this information and walk away with tremendous resource. I am joined today by Brian Schnazy with Hub International. Brian, it's, it's great to uh, be on this call with you. A uh, pleasure to be here. Well, this is great, Brian. I know uh, there is a lot of information that we want to get through. And so uh, you and I were talking offline a little bit saying, okay, we're going to we're going to move through this. And we know that at the very end, if our listeners are saying, I wish they would have covered more, uh, we're going to give them a resource as a way of finding more information via website. But before we, um, before we get to the end, let's jump, let's go ahead and get started. Brian, I'm impressed with um, your background, which is a statement to Hub International as far as their business model with regards to your role. So thank you. Maybe just let our listeners know a little bit of what you bring to the table with your background. Well, thanks. Uh, by way of experience, uh, and my introduction to risk management came at, at the state uh, regulatory level, I uh, worked at the Department of Commerce implementing internal controls and, uh, and then spent a number of years in the FBI uh, working complex financial crimes uh, out West and uh, a, tr- a tremendously exciting and, and um, uh, important um, work being done there for sure. Uh, I transitioned into Uh, retail theft and fraud prevention. I was leading uh, assets protection teams at a a Fortune 50 company for the last several years, and then most recently have joined uh, Hub within their risk services division. Uh, And for those who don't know Hub, uh, we're a a top five insurance broker, uh, but a a lot more than just uh, insurance. Um, The the company uh, handles business insurance, employee benefits, Uh, offering financial services and and consulting. Uh, But within risk services, I uh, am part of a practice called the Organizational Resilience uh, Team. And uh, we are a a group focused on helping clients to build and develop risk management frameworks and understand uh, basically how to manage uh, the risk that we're all facing today. Well, and I think how timely, you know, I think with the pandemic now, the year that we've just had, Maybe if we can dig a little bit into that, you know, how has the pandemic impacted organizations to be more resilient? And, and really, what are you seeing out there as a result of the year we've just have come through and what you project moving into the future? Oh, yeah, great question. Uh, and certainly timely. I, I think resilience is, it, you know, it's a state of being. So if, if, if we're talking about a tennis ball, resilience has to do with the rubber material and like what it's made of, right? And when we talk about an organization, Resilience is very simply its ability or capacity to anticipate and prepare for and respond to and adapt to change and and disruptions. Um, The purpose of that, as we think about organizations and businesses, is simply to survive and prosper. And so if resiliency is the outcome, uh, risk management is really the action of trying to achieve that resilient state. And What's interesting about the pandemic is that it just informed us of the level of resiliency required to survive and thrive. I think prior to last February, if I talked to clients about a pandemic disruption that would shut down the entire supply chain, uh, whole industries and economies, I probably would have been laughed out of the boardroom. Uh, if, If I'd have suggested they spend a whole bunch of time and money and dedicated resources on risk management, I might have been um, even chased out of the boardroom. Um, I think the other thing, Sue, is that we experience this new level of compounding disruption, right? So our business leaders uh, were managing a pandemic, and then on top of that, had to deal and lead through uh, catastrophic weather events or unprecedented civil unrest. And so it just really informed the new level of, uh, of resiliency required to make it today. You know, I, I think that's so important. And I think as a chamber of commerce, we recognize what our businesses have had to go through and what they are faced with and organizations in general on any given day. 
And I, and I think this topic is so timely because as our businesses are really ramping up back to pre-COVID uh, planning and uh, preparation, I do believe, I agree with you, and you did a beautiful job of outlining, you know, the different areas of resilience. And it's interesting, my sense is there are probably several areas to be more specific when, when we hear the word resilience. And I know that through your work, um, you have really worked to outline those areas, kind of the, the quick and dirty way of having our, maybe our listeners start compartmentalizing the areas that, by which they need to be focused upon. And maybe you can just kind of move through that as a starting point uh, for the thought process and the planning, uh, just to, so that we can be better prepared. Certainly. And I think if your organization's here today, you've already de demonstrated some level of resiliency. And so I think now is the perfect time to take that adaptability and the, the creativity and the resourcefulness that you and we sort of found within ourselves to that next level. And the next level is implementing formal and well-developed programs um, or frameworks as, a, as we call them. Uh, and, and what that means at the high level is committing to a reoccurring process of identifying and evaluating that risk and then mitigating it um, and, and, and the potential for it. So when, when we say enterprise security risk management, we're talking about a concept and that might be a term uh, that our listeners will recognize. The core philosophy behind it says that you're putting risk management not as an expense item, um, or not as a cost of, of doing business. It says that you're actually um, tying that to your strategic or your organizational initiatives. Um, basically saying we can't really do one. We can't take advantage of opportunities without um, you know, a formal process of considering the risk around it. And so there are uh, realms within that larger um, uh, uh, sort of philosophical approach and what we, what we mean specifically is like cybersecurity risk management or theft and fraud risk management or business continuity, which is you know, really a uh, conglomeration of emergency action preparedness and crisis management planning along with continuity planning. So those are some of the specific realms in which um, risk management formal frameworks can take shape. And, and when you are talking to potential uh, organizations or entities that are moving through that. Uh, you all obviously are experienced in that space and you're bringing together systems and, and real deliverables within each of those areas, depending on what realm they tend to focus on. Are there some that you can just put out as examples that might trigger to our listeners? Okay, I, I relate to that or I can understand how that has a direct impact to what we're trying to plan for in our organization. Well, sure. Uh, and let's just take one that I'm sure is on everybody's mind, cyber, cybersecurity risk. I think uh, business email compromise and ransomware are public enemy number one and number two today. And so um, if you're uh, implementing security risk management in this area, what framework have you chosen, right? I, I talk to clients about NIST, but do you know what that is? And have you looked up what sort of guidance um, and assessments that you can um, use there, these frameworks and industry standards exist and are, are very available to you. Have you conducted any level of risk assessment? Um, you know, could you show, uh, could you show someone your incident or breach response plan and what happened when you tested it? Um, and another factor here is, you know, when we talk about risk management, there are really two aspects. There's uh, managing the risk you retain but there's transferring the risk that you can. And so, you know, have you successfully transferred risk either via contracts or um, language that indemnifies you as an organization or even insurance, right? And then lastly in cyber, the hardest factor to control is the human factor. So do your employees and does everybody in the office have a solid awareness of the risk and of the schemes that are out there today? Um, business continuity is again, something different. And so if you're, if you're the DIY business owner or this, or looking for the scrappy, uh, quick and dirty, what should I be thinking about? Um, you know, depending on the structure and organization, do you have an emergency action plan that helps you get people and property, you know, safe 
in those first few minutes of a disruptive event? Do you also have or, or want a crisis management plan, which is an exercise of being ready as a team? How are we going to communicate? How are we going to assemble? What are we going to say? Do we have the resources available to handle a, a, a crisis today? And then moving into the, you know, in the crawl, walk, run of business continuity, then comes continuity plans. And there, that's an exercise of tying the critical business activities of your organization to their underlying dependencies. So basically payroll as an example, um, what's required in order to pay our employees. And if we have a major disruptive event, what are the things, the systems, the facilities, the uh, suppliers that we need to be thinking about uh, as we try to recover from that disruptive event? And have we prioritized those events so that we're not spending time on things uh, that aren't the most critical? So that's, that's we often call that a business impact analysis and that's a, a critical part of continuity, for example. Well, and as you work hands-on with these organizations and businesses, are there are there companies that you've said, okay, they they have figured this out, they're doing it the right way, and are there those that you've come across that um, maybe have not? And the reason I ask that is that so many so many of us always love love to learn by examples, and sometimes those examples can be can be uh, very good at getting you where you need to be at a much quicker pace. Are, are there some that you can speak to with regards that might be, uh, maybe our listeners would trigger something for our listeners to say, okay, I, now I understand this a little bit better now. Sure, absolutely. And I think we, we understand several aspects, although we may not recognize them right away. Uh, the, the new workplace is different and we have had to take on new roles to make it all work. And, and we're having to work in ways and locations that we never did before. So those organizations that either before that had the level of foresight and flexibility um, to lead through that were positioned much better. Um, it's now a prerequisite, right? As we consider going back in hybrid versions, it's now just a, a sort of price of entry uh, for doing business is to have that level of flexibility. But those who were set up in advance and had thought about that or, or were able to react quickly came out uh, ahead. Dy being dynamic is another thing, right? So organizations, um, that staffed and hired and developed the skills and competencies um, to support their mission and their workforce were um, uh, in a better position as well, right? The, the relationship between employers and employees has been tested during those compounding events that I was talking about previously. So those that have, um, you know, dedicated themselves to the workforce have reaped uh, the rewards of, I think, productivity and loyalty, right? And and so, uh, again, I think a tenant of resiliency is, is an organization with a positive culture, a healthy workplace that supports uh, a workforce that then in turn is able to be flexible, to be dynamic, and to get scrappy. Uh, getting scrappy, those organizations that um, weren't just reacting or leading and, and living in a, from a place of fear over the last 12 months, um, they, they might have made it through the hard times, but the organizations who were healthy and capable of creativity, we're actually able to make the most of the opportunities that were there uh, and to be seized, right? You know, we, we've talked about that there's a lot more to talk about here. I think we just kind of really just touched on the surface of this. And I know we've talked um, the best way for our listeners to maybe find out more information about this. Um, and if you want to Reference that, that would be great. I want to make sure we drive them to the, to the best website, as well as knowing that Hub International is here in, in our community and, and a strong supporter of the Chamber of Commerce. But for those listeners who say, you know, this is, um, this is something that has been within our business model. We know that as moving back to a re-entry, reopen model for our organization, um, how would you best, what would you suggest the next couple of steps to be for our listeners? Well, uh, great question. And hubinternational.com is a great starting place um, to, to leverage resources that um, are free and, and right, right there for you uh, in terms of uh, risk uh, bulletins, guidance, uh, helpful, um, helpful strategies as well. My colleagues in the Tallahassee Hub office have been in the community for uh, several decades and, and are also you know, standing by to help uh, help you start a conversation about about either transferring that risk and understanding what 
and what ways and means you have to do that and also then managing that risk that you retain. Uh, but outside of those two resources, uh, for the aspiring risk uh, security risk manager or or um, executive who's now considering this, uh, leverage the the resources that are available through industry standards and guidelines because they are they're spot on. And then also um, seek you know seek assistance and consulting in in right sizing that for your organization. Certainly, what's right for an an enterprise of of a thousand employees may not be right for the family office of six. And so uh, right sizing your risk management framework is, a, is an important way to keep the balance of cost and benefit. Well, and I think that's, that's a wonderful way to close because that I think is a, a reflection of what our community represents. We have many small business owners and we have many larger enterprises. And, you know, I think the information is so timely, Brian, on what you're presenting. Uh, we want, everyone to be able to move through this pandemic and really the new landscape of operations as a result. And really, really appreciate you kind of laying it out for us in simplistic terms and, and also providing some resources. So thank you so much. Uh, any any parting words you'd like to, to give to our listeners? Well, uh, I, this is my full-time job and I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it. I'm open to a uh, a conversation with anybody about how to manage that risk and certainly want to give everybody a pat on the back and a uh, stop and congratulate yourselves first on being uh, a, a, alive and, and functioning today as an organization uh, that, that wasn't easy to get through and uh, we can only improve from here. So uh, I, my encouragement and uh, best of luck to all the listeners. Wonderful. Brian, thanks so much for spending time with us. Thank you very much, Sue.